Is my mic on? It sounds like it. Yep. Okay. Loud as hell. I got it. Uh, good morning, everybody. How are you all? I can't believe this spotlight. I actually brought my sunglasses with me, but I don't know if that's, a, if that's the right look. Uh, good to see you all. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be here with you this morning uh, for, uh, uh, for this session. Um, and I hope you enjoyed the rec so far. We enjoyed having you. We enjoyed meeting you out in the, in the hallways and, and having uh, the, the you know, conversation and the dialogues that we have. So, um, uh, so thank you for being here. Um, given that this is uh, one of the last sessions uh, of, 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 uh, of the conference, um, I'm thinking you're here because you're really committed. So we appreciate that. We appreciate your being here. And we are very committed to making this uh, a worthwhile uh, session for you. So stick with us, don't change the channel on us yet, just give us a little bit of time to, and we'll warm up and, and, and get it done for you. Um, my name is Mo Shams, I work for the NRC. I'm, uh, I'm the director of the, of the Division of Advanced Reactors in the Office of uh, New Reactor Regulation. I, I also direct the uh, Research and Test Reactor Program and Medical Isotope Program as well, but that's actually a hobby that I do on nights and weekends. <laughs> Not, not really. It's one division, uh, and I'm so proud to be part of, of the division and the work that this group uh, you know, does, and hopefully we can, uh, we can share that, some of that with you today. Um, uh, I, I made a joke about you know, the, this being the, uh, one of the last sessions in, at the RIC, but I'm actually, uh, you know, uh, I feel heartwarmed by, by seeing so many of you in the room here today, so thank you uh, for, for being here, and, uh, and hopefully we have a great dialogue today on, on a really exciting topic, uh, that's microreactors uh, and, and their deployments. Our session's title is Assembling the Pieces, Mo uh, pieces uh, Mobilizing Nuclear uh, Energy with Factory Fabricated and uh, uh, Transportable Microreactors, and I am honored to be the session chair. Um, I believe the topic is very befitting of, uh, of the theme for the RIC, which we know is uh, uh, adapting to a changing landscape. Um, I would honestly say that indeed microreactors represent a remarkable uh, change and a remarkable uh, uh, adaptation need for the nuclear landscape. And, uh, and I believe that the regulator, uh, the developers, and many other organizations, as you're going to hear today, are recognizing that change and are adapting to it. Uh, so, in fact, I hope that our discussion today gives you the confidence that significant steps are being taken already to adapt, and, and I hope that we all can be, uh, walk away from here and aspire to take even more bold steps to adapt uh, what we do to, to, to help safely uh, deploy this technology. Uh, in fact, I wanted to pause, on, pause on, that, um, on that point a little bit and say that as the regulator, I assure you that uh, what we do and will continue to do will be focused on a safe regulation of this new technology in a way that's consistent with our uh, principles of good regulation and absolutely returns the most value to the public. Uh, with that, uh, we have a fabulous uh, panel with us today. I'm so grateful for each and every one of them to be here. They traveled uh, far and away and, and uh, uh, for their willingness to, to share their insights with us. So for that, thank you all for being here and, and a proud round of applause for, for the panel. <laughs> You're gonna get a few of those this morning. Um, we'll introduce the panel here in a second, but before that, let me just go through a couple of logis logistics uh, to kind of get us get, get, you know, going here in a sec. So, um, our vision for the session is a moderated discussion where each of our panelists will first share a few thoughts, then followed by a dialogue where we're going to dig a little deeper into uh, the, the thoughts that are being shared and, and uh, some pertinent topics related to uh, factory fabricated uh, microreactors. Of course, the part that we are all most interested in is engaging with you, hearing your questions, uh, taking your feedback. So please keep them, you know, keep them coming. We're looking forward to them and looking forward to answering them later on in the session. Um, I'm sure by now you already know how this works, but uh, I'll just repeat it anyway for you. So uh, you get to uh, feed us questions through the QR code. So just scan that and hopefully it comes up for you. It did for me. And um, in the app, you should be able to direct your question to any of the panelists, uh, including myself. I think I, I show up under NRC staff, so that would be me or Duke. Um, so so uh, in addition to, to the question and answer uh, element of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the app, that is, there's also a feedback tab in there. So please, uh, if, you get, you know, if you get a chance and, and would like to share some feedback with us, uh, by all means, please do that. Uh, you know, we would like to have it to continue to get better um, every time. So with that, so let's get started with the introduction of our, uh, our panel. So I'm, uh, I'm honored to, uh, uh, to uh, I'll turn it to each one of the panelists to introduce themselves. I felt that's a, a bit more uh, you know, personal, so I'll start with Duke. 
Yeah, good morning, my name is Duke Kennedy. I'm a senior project manager in the Advanced Reactor Policy Branch in Danu at NRC. Good morning, thanks for uh, your interest in this session. Uh, my name is John Jackson. I'm the National Technical Director for the Department of Energy, Office of Nuclear Energy's Microreactor Program. Uh, good morning, um, my name is Mike Corletti. I'm with Westinghouse, uh, Senior Director for Engineering and Licensing for the Avinci uh, Technologies. Good morning, uh, my name is Steve Schultem. I'm the uh, Director of Regulatory and Mission Assurance in our uh, BWXT Advanced Technologies group. Um, Advanced Technologies was stood up to, to do a lot of the new and novel things that we're doing as BWXT. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Kirsty Gogan, co-founder and uh, managing director of TerraPraxis. We're a nonprofit, and we're focused on developing uh, strategies for speed and scale for nuclear energy to be more useful in our decarbonization and energy growth targets. Thanks. Looking forward to the panel. Thank you. Thanks, Kirsty. Uh, thank you, everyone. What a fabulous panel. Again, I can't wait to, uh, to hear uh, their presentations and, and, and their thoughts that they're going to share with us this morning. So uh, next slide, please, if I can go to that. Thank you. Uh, if you'd allow me, I'll just take a minute or two, uh, help orient our, our sort of conversation a bit and, and kind of give a little bit from under, uh, under the hood or behind the curtain about what the regulator has been doing, uh, what our accomplishments and activities are associated with advanced reactors in general, but certainly as they relate to uh, uh, micro reactors as well. So if you look on the slide, you'll see a number of stats that we've uh, accumulated over the past couple of years or so, a little bit longer than that, uh, starting with a, uh, uh, our engagement domestically and internationally. Uh, uh, we are closely engaged with our colleagues and partners at DOE to share knowledge and leverage our uh, resources. Uh, we've signed 10 memorandums of understandings. Those are intended to organize our efforts around the number of activities we do together, uh, whether it's uh, safety analysis software, environmental reviews, testing, including microreactor testing, uh, at times public engagement, uh, training to some, uh, some of the vendors about regulatory pathways and, and the like. So a lot of activities that we have and engagement we have for our partners in, at DOE. Um, on the international side, again, a, a broad spectrum of activities and engagements on the international side. One of the key ones for us is our engagement with our uh, Canadian uh, counterparts, Canadian regulators. Um, we, we do that to jointly solve technical issues, to support more efficient licensing reviews, leverage, uh, uh, leverage the physics and in engineering to be able to support much more efficient uh, licensing. We have several work plans uh, with, uh, with, with our counterparts on a number of topics. We've issued eight joint reports so far spanning uh, fuel quals, spanning uh, uh, safety classifications and alike. So we're excited about that effort and, and we're looking to continue to build on it. Um, actually, uh, earlier this week, we've expanded the effort giving its, its, uh, its value so far. We've expanded to include the UK regulators. I, I, yeah, the chairman signed that for us um, on, on Tuesday um, evening. So we're looking to further uh, pool our resources between the three regulators and, and uh, aim for greater efficiencies. Um, and optimizing the regulatory framework, um, our framework, it, for, for, uh, has been built for years for the light water reactor fleet, and, um, and uh, we've been working to optimize it for some time. So we've introduced a number of enhancements to it so far, particularly to, to create a framework around consequence oriented. So uh, we, we've delivered the, the Part 53 proposed rule to the Commission uh, last year. Uh, the Commission issued the EP rule, uh, the emergency preparedness rule, uh, late last year, November, December timeframe. We have a rule up with the Commission also on uh, limited security as well. All these rules, again, are intended to provide a graded, uh, more scaled approach that in turn will support uh, reactors like microreactors as well as you know, other types of reactors. Um, we've been solving a number of other uh, policy issues as well. These are just the, hi the highlights that I wanted to go over. But there's one in particular I wanted to point to, which is um, uh, uh, functional containment. We're, been, we're able to enable the use of functional containment as opposed to traditional uh, containment buildings. And that was a key for our ability to license the Kairos Hermes uh, reactor uh, late last year. 
as well as um, our ability to be able to license many of the uh, micro reactors going forward, such that you know to, to, uh, provide that foundation and, and efficiency in, in that regard. Um, speaking of Kairos Hermes, I did just mention that we uh, uh, the commission issued the construction permit application for that test reactor uh, late last year, around December time frame. Uh, what I want to highlight is this was a successful uh, review for us. Uh, it was done on a tight schedule, uh, on, under uh, the, the very uh, specific budget for that project uh, that we assigned ourselves to do early on. And, and, and that success uh, it was, was built on utilizing a number of strategies that we've, uh, we've been building uh, 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 around for, for some time, including the use of uh, core teams that actually allows us to focus our reviews on the um, elements of most safety significance to, um, you know, to, to, to the design that we're looking at. Uh, and our plan is continue to refine these strategies, continue to use them for ongoing reviews, as well as future reviews uh, and, as, as, as we move forward. Um, uh, one, of, uh, one of the key uh, aspects for us uh, also, uh, or one of the, I should say one of the key uh, success strategies for us is pre-application. Again, not a lot of water reactor, new technologies, they, uh, uh, there, there are plenty of, of opportunities to dialogue, to, to provide feedback, uh, to learn about the design. So pre-application gives us that opportunity. It pays dividends in learning the design and assessing regulatory applicability and understanding the deployment model, the what can and cannot be done, uh, and what adjustments we need to do. Uh, so, so a great vehicle for us uh, are instruments to provide feedback, our uh, white papers and, uh, and topical reports, plus other uh, items as well. We just reported on the slide the number of white papers that we've, uh, we've we, uh, white papers and topical reports that is that we've uh, we, we've gone through over the past several years. And and what you can see from the slides is we're bragging by uh, being able to do it ahead of schedule, ahead of historical schedule, and we continue to get efficient in, in, in these items as well. Um, finally, I don't want to leave the slide without highlighting um, our, our public engagements. We are very passionate about that. It's a fundamental part of what we do, our ability to be transparent, open about how we do it, and engage with the public. So, uh, so you'll see some of the stats about uh, how, we, uh, how we approach our public engagements on, on advanced reactors, and we are you know, definitely committed to continue to do that. Uh, going forward. So, so a fair amount of activities, a fair amount of uh, efforts uh, that are going on in, in advanced reactors and by extension for micro reactors as well to facilitate their, their licensing in, in an efficient and, and hopefully an open transparent way. So um, thank you for giving me the chance to share uh, these thoughts with you. Um, I'll now turn it to the more important side of, of, of this, uh, this equation here, which would be the panel. So let me let me send it over to Duke to talk about uh, uh, some of our uh, the agency's activities on policy work. Duke. Okay, thank you, Mo. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry, uh, I go back one. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Uh, so good morning, I'm Duke Kennedy. I'm a senior project manager in the Advanced Reactor Policy Branch in Danio at NRC. I'm going to share with you some recent efforts by the NRC staff to optimize the regulatory landscape for licensing and deployment of factory fabricated microreactors. I'd like to start by thanking NRC staff and managers that have contributed to all of these optimization efforts that I'll talk about today. There have been many creative and critical thinkers involved uh, in this work and uh, working collaboratively to protect public health and safety and enable the safe use of nuclear technology. Just highlight our Advanced Reactor Ready logo here on our website. Um, we take pride in being open, transparent regulators and engaging with stakeholders in this website is a, is a great tool uh, for those endeavors. Next slide. So the staff is proactively working to enhance clarity, reliability, and efficiency for licensing regulation of factory fabricated microreactors. Um, Potential approaches to addressing new licensing strategies must be coherent, logical, and practical to allow for safe and secure deployment. A reliability, meaning prompt, fair, and decisive regulation is crucial to achieving stability in licensing and deployment, especially in the scenario uh, of widespread deployment involving tens of reactors per year or more. Finally, risk-informed and performance-based regulation will help to deliver timely results and use resources effectively. Next slide, please. So here is a graphic depicting the generic microreactor deployment model. Uh, this is a combination of 
aspects of deployment provided by stakeholders as well as NRC staff assumptions. On the left, you can see a factory where a reactor would be manufactured, fueled, and potentially tested operationally. Um, moving to the right, we have transportation to deployment sites. In the middle, we have power reactor operation at the deployment site for electricity production, heat generation, or other uses. Uh, moving uh, to the right again, we have transportation from the deployment site back to a decommissioning or refurbishment facility where the reactors would end their life or potentially be refueled and redeployed. And so this provides a, a common framework for uh, optimization efforts that we're considering in, uh, for policy topics and, and guidance development. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to talk about the options paper the staff presented to the commission in January of this year. Uh, considering feedback from numerous public meetings with stakeholders and pre-application engagements with developers, the NRC staff took a proactive approach uh, to prioritize topics related to microreactor licensing and deployment. Um, the topics that popped to the top of the priority list uh, were the near-term topics of uh, fuel loading at a factory and potentially operational testing at a factory, and these affect the upfront portion of the microreactor deployment life cycle. Uh, fuel loading at a factory is obviously something much different than what we've considered before, but this is an area where it uh, provides an example of how these new deployment models and, and technologies may provide overall safety benefits. In this case, fuel loading at a factory may allow for repeated fuel loading operations where operational experience is built up quickly and avoid having to perform this operation as infrequent operation at the various deployment sites. Next slide, please. So this slide covers the recommended options in the paper provided to the commission. Uh, these options uh, would take advantage of the existing regulatory framework and not require rulemaking, and so that uh, makes it possible that they could be uh, implemented in the near term on shorter time frames. So the first recommended option is an approach in which a factory fabricated Reactor that included features to preclude criticality would not be in operation when it's loaded with fuel, and operation would instead begin when those features are removed. Uh, this is significant because it means that a reactor that was simply loaded with fuel would not require a full operating license. Um, and this enables the second approach here on the slide, which is that fuel loading could occur with features to preclude criticality under a manufacturing license uh, uh, and a special nuclear material license. So this has a potential advantage uh, that the regulations for special nuclear material licenses and uh, criticality safety better match the technical and safety aspects of loading fuel into a microreactor. Um, compared to typical power reactor licensing, this would likely reduce administrative requirements and improve efficiency and timeliness of licensing without reducing safety. So the last recommendation, uh, recommended option described on the slide is for an approach that would apply most of the non-power reactor safety regulations and possibly some of the environmental regulations to authorize fuel loading and operational testing at a factory. Now the NRC staff recognizes that um, these would be power reactors, however, the characteristics of these reactors when operated for testing in a factory would be similar to those for existing non-power reactors. Um, so an advantage of this approach is that it would minimize the need to tailor the power reactor safety regulations on a case-by-case -case basis and instead use the existing performance-based non-power reactor regulations uh, to cover operational testing in a factory. And as a final note, features to preclude criticality would allow for transportation of a fueled microreactor under the current regulations because the reactor would not be considered to be in operation when loaded with fuel. And so this reactor could be transported under the provisions of a manufacturing license and if it contained radioactive material, for example, after operational testing, these would be covered um, by a materials license. Next slide, please. So I'll just briefly mention that the staff requirements memorandum related to the ongoing rulemaking known as Part 53 was recently issued, and it contained direction for the staff to address some of these issues uh, in, in the proposed rule and after the proposed rule phase as well. Next slide, please. 
So here you can see a, a substantial list of regulatory considerations and policy topics. So the NRC staff continues to uh, hear from uh, developers and other stakeholders about priorities for these topics, and so we're uh, working to uh, prioritize them, them now. Um, these topics, many of them were also covered in the paper we sent to the commission and included uh, near-term approaches for addressing them as well as, as next steps, uh, which could include additional policy papers uh, or other actions. Next slide, please. Uh, so finally, I'd like to uh, share these success strategies, and I, I think Mo just covered these uh, adequately in, in his introduction, so thank you, Mo. Um, but in, in the specific context of, of micro-reactor uh, regulation, I think I'd really like to highlight the proactive and stakeholder engagement because this has given us information that we need to start considering these policy topics and making uh, informed decisions about how we can uh, address them in the near term to provide uh, clarity, reliability, uh, and efficiency as we optimize the regulatory landscape for deploying and licensing factory fabricated microreactors. So, thank you. Much appreciated, Duke. Thank you. Uh, let's, let's, uh, let's go now to John to talk about uh, some of the efforts in the Department of Energy and, and give us a little bit about the Marvel project. John? Thanks, Mo. <clears throat> uh, so, so the Department of Energy's microreactor program, in, in case you're unaware, is, is part of a larger portfolio of advanced reactor technology, um, congressionally appropriated uh, directed research and development programs. So. This is part of a larger effort to bring to bear the resources under the Department of Energy on, uh, on um, something as, as, as important as, as deployment of microreactor technology. Uh, next slide, please. So the, in, in, in essence, the broad vision of, of the, the microreactor program is, is that through um, uh, cross-cutting research and development of, and technology demonstration support, we can um, broaden um, as necessary the, the um, deployment of, of microreactors. <clears throat> You'll often hear microreactors referred to as, as being deployed, uh, at least for the first of a kind, in, in, in Arctic situations or, or for DoD applications, places where resiliency is very important and, and the cost of energy is very high. Um, the vision of the microreactor program is, is to remove that barrier so that you have more of a strategic portfolio at your disposal for as, as you select a clean energy option for, for, for your need. Uh, so we've, we've clearly got the gigawatt scale light water reactors that, that currently represent um, over 50% of the nation's clean energy production. Uh, we don't expect those to go away anytime soon. <coughs> um, you've got the hundreds of megawatts scale uh, with more modularities, uh, small modular reactors, and then of course you've got the microreactor technology in the ones to tens of megawatts range. <clears throat> um, so, so the thinking is that that um, broad. What I mean by broad deployment is is of course um, a, again uh, being able to select based on need rather than availability. Uh, so, so we 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 pursue this um, through identification of, of of technical issues that we can resolve to enhance the economics or licensability of microreactor technology um, by bringing to bear on on the problem the the unique capability and infrastructure that exists within the the nation's la laboratory complex. Uh, the program itself is structured around four four technical focus areas. System integration and analysis is more or less a gateway to the program. Uh, here we perform techno-economic analyses, uh, regulatory support um, with an eye toward identification of these technical problems that, that we can help to resolve. Technology maturation is our most broad area. Uh, this covers um, everything from, from um, characterization or characterization of, of structural moderators, um, high temperature structural moderators to um, uh, my, uh, automated control schemes and, and deployment of advanced sensors for robust structural health monitoring. <clears throat> uh, demonstration support capabilities is our non-nuclear testing branch. Uh, this brings to bear um, uh, resources like the, the magnet integral effects uh, test capability, the microreactor agile non-nuclear experimental test bed. And then at the tip of the spear, we've got our microreactor application focus area. 
uh, for integrated nuclear testing and applied R&D. And clearly, this is where the, the star of the show today um, sits, the, the Marvel microreactor. Next slide, please. If, if you look at our R&D our portfolio, we tend to, to focus on technologies that, that enable the, the three distinguishing characteristics that define, um, in, in our estimation, uh, microreactors. That is, that they're factory fabricated, transportable, and self-regulating. So if you look across the spectrum, and, and, and I'll caveat this by saying we don't have infinite funding, so we can't cover every single one of these topics, but <clears throat> um, Mike will give us infinite funding here eventually. But uh, uh, for, for now, we rely on, the, on, on, on uh, Congress. Um, so um, things, like I said, like characterization of yttrium hydride, which is capable of uh, maintaining its moderating capability uh, to temperatures in ex excess of 700 degrees Celsius, which it clearly ties into the economic economics of microreactors as more efficiency comes with higher temperatures, generally speaking. Um, reactor controls is an area of emphasis for us because we can affect change in this area very rapidly. Um, um, demonstration and deployment of advanced sensors for robust structural health monitoring, which in turn feeds automation schemes and, and uh, remote operation capability. Uh, clearly, we need robust monitoring of, of these technologies before we turn it loose. And, you know, I, I, I will just say right up front that, that we don't plan to deploy uh, full auto, uh, automatic operation to begin with, or full autonomous operation to begin with. but as evidenced by our microreactor, um, <clears throat> our MAX system, microreactor uh, automated control system uh, platform that we're developing, um, we, we take a graded approach and, and add complexity and, and thus capability as we proceed. And then structural material, clearly, you know, creep resistance is, a, is at a premium for structural materials, um, Section 3, Div 5 compliance. Uh, we need we need to make sure we have a robust NQA1 supply chain. We're we're helping in these spaces, and and then transportation and siting, which which of course is a topic of discussion today, gets very interesting um, from a technology and and policy issue issue standpoint. Um, what I will say with respect to the Marvel microreactor is the Marvel microreactor, in some way or another, touches each and every single one of these enabling technology areas. Um, so that's uh, the reason it's, it's an emphasis in our program and the tip of the spear. Next slide, please. Um, these are just pictures of our uh, single effects test capability, our single primary heat extraction and removal emulator, and our microreactor agile non-nuclear experimental test bed, which is essentially an electrically heated um, um, uh, microreactor uh, capable of testing engineering scale uh, test articles. Um, we are connecting a power a Brayton cycle power conversion unit to, to it this year to, to put the ribbon on it uh, or put the bow on it as it were um, and, and offer the full suite of capability from, from characterization of, of heat generated on electric heated core through the heat exchanger uh, to power conversion. So this is a, a, a resource that's available uh, now. Next slide, please. Which brings us to the, to the Marvel Microreactor. <coughs> uh, Marvel is an acronym. We love our acronyms. Microreactor Applications Research Validation and Evaluation. Um, uh, don't tell Disney's lawyers. Uh, we're, we're not going to... Um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, so, so Marvel is a very small reactor. It is not a commercial scale reactor. Uh, it is not intended to be a commercial reactor. Um, it, it is 85 kilowatts thermal capability, uh, 20 kilowatts electric via four Stirling engines, <coughs> um, intended to utilize off-the-shelf technology to the extent possible with speed in mind and, and reduced cost of production in mind. Um, and we envision it at, at requiring two operators, although clearly as, as a first of a kind, this will have a lot of eyes on it all the time. Um, the, the primary project goal is very simply development of a small-scale microreactor that provides a platform to test the unique operational aspects and applications of microreactors. This is also implicitly about reaching the end user, about reaching the public. This is about giving, answering that question that, that comes time and time again, and that is when can I see one of these in operation. Uh, with Marvel, the, the thinking is that we can say now, you, you can come to the Idaho National Laboratory and you can see this thing in operation. We're not probably not going to allow you to walk up to it and touch it, but, but you, can, you can certainly um, um, be near it. <clears throat> um, 
objectives are clear, operational microreactor um, as, as, as fast as we can. Uh, we recognize that the clock is ticking with respect to, to energy needs and clean energy needs. Um, and, and there are a lot of commercial vendors lined up <coughs> to my right um, that, that want to deploy these things. So, so we hope to, to, to affect this by, by paving the pathway, uh, developing processes and procedures uh, to enable commercial demonstrations. Um, and which are expected to take place in our dome facility um, and share this learning with as, as openly as possible with the public and developers. Next slide, please. These are just some high-level technical characteristics of the marble microreactor. You'll see that it's natural circulation, sodium potassium primary coolant, uh, uses control drums rather than control rods. There are four of them. Um, it uses standard trig of fuel. Um, when I say standard, it, it is an element that is 10 inches longer than the standard university element, but it is still self-moderating, very high, high safety pedigree, uh, uranium zirconium hydride, uh, self-moderating fuel. And then the uh, primary coolant boundary is, is uh, 316H stainless steel. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Um, we did build a, a, a full-scale uh, thermohydraulic prototype of the marble microreactor pictured here. This is uh, installed as of now at, at uh, Creative Engineers Incorporated in New Freedom, Pennsylvania. Um, this, the idea behind this is, is validation for our, our marble uh, thermohydraulic system. Um, we clearly want to do this right. Uh, so so this, this system did operate and demonstrate natural flow as evidenced by the, the plot on the lower left. Next slide, please. So where are we now? Um, we had a, a massive milestone achieved in, in September of 2023, and that was achievement of 90% final design, uh, which is, the, is a major step in the direction to, to uh, enable fabrication and eventual construction and operation. Indeed, we've, we've invoked our long lead procurement process to um, begin manufacturing. We've, we've cut steel on the guard vessel, as you can, uh, which you'll see is the third item from the left uh, in the picture on the lower left. Uh, next slide, please. So again, this is about reaching the public, it's about reaching end users, it's about addressing questions, it's about paving paths. <clears throat> um, it, it's about removing that barrier to market entry as we see it. Next slide, please. We have developers engaged, uh, most notably, uh, recently we've, we've worked with Allo Atomics and, and StarCube who both publicly claim to, to leverage the Marble Microreactor uh, project overtly. Others are interested in the technology. Next slide, please. And I'll end with this. This is a conceptual utilization model. Uh, the microreactor program itself is responsible for the, 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 uh, the, the microreactor itself in the green box um, and, and operation of the microreactor. But clearly, uh, fundamental data generated by the microreactor and its startup processes and, and steady state operation will be of interest to, to entities like nu Nuclear Energy University programs participants. And then um, INL's net zero initiative uh, will, will plans to pilot a, a net zero demonst microgrid demonstration, uh, nuclear powered, um, and then interaction with our integrated energy systems, which is a sister program at, at INL or at DOE. Uh, and that's all I've got. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. All right. Mike? Thank you, John. Yeah, my, my boss has told me I was supposed to try to get some money from you today, John. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> money will go one way or the other. <laughs> anyway, so please, uh, so uh, good morning again. Mike Corletti, uh, response for engineering licensing with Vinci. We go on to the next one. So uh, first slide here, I just to, to touch on really at Westinghouse, uh, the portfolio of, you know, of, of products of how we're uh, trying to, to, to provide energy solutions for decarbonizing uh, our electricity supply. I can't go without talking, saying one thing about AP1000 with, uh, <laughs> with, uh, with, uh, with the reactors that uh, are now operating in Georgia, operating in China, and more under construction in China. And I can't wait till we have more under construction in this country as well. Um, uh, we all are. The, We all are also developing an SMR based on this AP1000 technology, uh, where it's 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 a PWR. It's a it's a single unit, basically proven fuel, 
proven components, really leveraging all of our experience from AP1000 to, to build a smaller reactor and, and constructible. Uh, you see long, long duration energy storage, but what I really want to talk about today is, 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 is our Vinci micro reactor. Um, personally, I've worked, this is my 41st year at Westinghouse. Um, 37 of those years was worked on that AP1000 on the left. And my leadership has told me I don't have another 37 years to get the Avinci designed and licensed. So they said, want me to get on with it. Next slide, please. Uh, here's our micro reactor, Avinci micro reactor. We call it a nuclear battery. Um, and, and, and yeah, that's a salesy thing, it sounds like, but it really does drive our innovation innovative thinking of how we need to look at this reactor. Um, micro reactors need to be flexible. They need to be transportable. Um, so they need to be small. Uh, the customers for micro reactors, and we'll talk about that, are, 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 not, um, are not looking for, you know, to be nuclear operators. So it, it needed to, 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 to fit, a, fit a market that, that we could deliver this quickly and install it quickly. Um, Basically, it uses, it's a heat pipe reactor. We'll talk more about heat pipes. Um, and the tech, we've been working on this design since about 2016, where we, we licensed the technology from Los Alamos National Labs, working quite a bit with national labs, both in Idaho, Los Alamos, and some of the others, with regards to the technology development, the fuel development. We use Triso Fuel. It's a graphite moderated core. Uh, and the, you know, the shutdown, uh, uh, the control drums, we have control drums on the periphery of the core that, that moderate the core, moderate the nuclear reaction, uh, and then shut down rods that can, can scram the reactor uh, as a diverse and safety-related means of shutdown. Uh, eliminated spent fuel storage on site. Basically, we bring the reactor to the site. It operates for eight years. After a cooling off period, we take it away from the site. Most of our customers aren't interested in, 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 in on-site storage. We have no on-site storage. Uh, the other is no big, no excavation, no deep excavation with regards to building the facility. It's a, it's a, it's a fairly tiny facility, about two, two and a half acres of land uh, nominally, to, but most of that is standoff. Uh, the, the, the reactor itself is, 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 is very small. We look to try to, we're working to be able to install it from the time it shows up at site to be uh, operating within 30 days. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we'll talk, you know, we started this, as I said, in around 2016. The initial customers that we were looking at, uh, remote communities, remote mining, uh, you know, we identified that uh, the, 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 these communities using diesel for electricity, for heating, um, and we looked, looking at, the, you know, the economics of what we thought we could do with, with a micro reactor, and, and we thought oh, maybe there's a possible market there. But the more we got into it and the more we started talking with customers, um, the, the use cases just keep, keep uh, I'll say, growing. And, uh, and, and, and I list many of them there. And I'm told, if not once, um, it seems like, you know, 10 times a week from, from our commercial folks, I could be selling a lot of these if you could just get it designed and licensed. So uh, uh, that's what drives us. Uh, um, uh, obviously, safety. Um, the design is safely, but, uh, but really to, we're, we're driving to have a, a product to market uh, uh, as quickly as we can. Uh, next slide, please. The next use case we've, we have discovered in the last couple of years has been uh, space. So we're not putting five megawatt uh, Avincis on the moon, but we are looking at space applications, very small applications for both fission surface power and also to uh, power uh, satellites in space. So pretty excited about the opportunities that this technology has. Next slide, please. This is, a, I mentioned, a heat pipe reactor. Um, you know, when I started on this about three and a half years ago, I didn't know, I said, tell me about these heat pipes. And they said, well, they, they cool your uh, computers and, they, and your laptops. And so the challenge has been is how do you take something that is in your laptop and can actually cool a nuclear reactor uh, at, at the scale? We've been investing quite a bit on figuring out how to take, design these heat pipes to bring it to scale. Um, uh, op they operate basically uh, to bring it to scale for a, for a power reactor. 
you'll see the, the, this is the reactor cooling system for our, us water guys. This, this is the, the heat pipe has a working fluid. Um, it's a liquid as its heat takes heat from the core. It goes to a vapor phase where then it passes through a heat, uh, air cooled heat exchanger on the right hand side and it, it returns, uh, it goes back to liquid and it returns through a, a wick that's in the center of that heat pipe through capillary action. It's a passive, passive cooling. Uh, it, it, the air cooled heat exchanger basically then we connect it to an open air Brayton system uh, for, to, 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 to make the 5 megawatts of electric. It's so about a 15 megawatt thermal reactor, 5 megawatts electric. This really is what enables the device to be passive, um, requiring less operators, and really to act as a nuclear battery. Next slide, please. So this is some pictures of, of things we're doing. I mean, so, you know, oh, back, please. Um, you know, the, the technical readiness of this, this is obviously a new technology. I, I guess it wants to keep going. Yeah. Yeah. I know, I'm sorry about that. But, but, but really, you don't increase the technical readiness of any technology through analysis, through paper. Uh, so we are building, um, what you see on the left is our, 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 um, a, uh, our manufacturing demo of our reactor. It's, it shows, and that's to scale for probably one of those space applications. Um, in, on the top right is our electrical demonstration unit. We're actually running a test today. Uh, we'll be running that at uh, over 800 C. Uh, that has a, it's an integral test, have seven uh, heat pipes of, 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 a, of a shorter dimension. Um, we, and, and what you see down below is, is, is testing of a glowing heat pipe that we do. Uh, that's just some of the, the manufacturing that we're doing at Westinghouse as we uh, develop this technology and increase its technical readiness. Why don't we get, you can stay at this slide since it really wants to, it really wants to go here. Um, so this, this slide is really showing our deployment model. It's a lot of similar uh, things that, that Duke spoke about, um, just maybe presented in a bit of a different way. The first one on the left is I'd like to spend a little time is on the nuclear test reactor. So um, we are working to, we are in the throes of designing and actually doing long lead procurements and we'll be starting manufacturing for a, a nuclear test reactor that we intend to deliver to Idaho National Labs and, and to operate in the dome facility. Uh, we'd like to be on test in the 26, 27 timeframe. Um, we have about 250 engineers working on this right now. Um, and, and so uh, um, the, the design will be, is a scaled, as I said, scaled uh, one fifth power scale, but the heat pipes are half scale, so it's about 12 foot uh, length heat pipe. So, and um, this year we've manufactured, or last year we manufactured the first 12 foot heat pipe. And that probably took us about six months. Uh, we need to get up to building about 800 in a year. So right now we're going on how do you take that lab scale manufacturing of heat pipes to, to, to full manufacturing capability. And, and that's, so that's a, a lot of what, 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 what we're doing now. Um, doing a lot of separate effects testing, uh, materials testing as well. These reactors are high temperature, um, so a lot of materials testing, working with the national labs, be it McMaster University up in, up in Canada, MIT, or the, uh, some of the other national labs. Uh, going through the, the model, again, assembled in a factory. That's very important for our deployment model. Uh, I think all of the microreactor vendors will tell you that. Our plan is to fuel in the factory, and so working through that. Um, transportation, so we're in the throes of developing a, a, a trans, transportation cask. Uh, we will then install, um, and uh, our goal is autonomous operation. We understand that we're not there yet, and that's, that will take steps, to, I, I think, very in line with what John said. Our plan is we want to dem demonstrate this reactor at, uh, at, at INL, demonstrate the reliability, and then we can get into how many operators we need and, and whatnot. Um, after eight years, our model is after a cooling off period, we'd remove the, the, the reactor from the site and either refurbish it, decommission it, and, and, and then store uh, the fuel storage at an interim fuel uh, storage facility. And lots of licensing challenges with all of those, I think, uh, uh, <laughs> that we get to, get to work with. Next slide, last slide. 
So just some of our recent achievements on Avinci, just to highlight, uh, I think I mentioned we were awarded uh, late last year uh, an award from the Air Force Research Lab on the Jetson program to develop a thermal propulsion Avinci reactor to power satellites. Um, really excited about that project. We were selected by INL for a feed study. We're in the throes of that right now to see what it's going to take to deploy the, um, the, our reactor in, in the dome. I know there's two other vendors as well, so there's three of us, three of us were selected, um, all wanting to be first into the dome uh, to, to, to perform that testing. That testing is critical, not only to demonstrate the technology, but it really is going to underpin the licensing basis with both the NRC um, and, and our intention is also with the CNSC in Canada. Um, very excited, two weeks ago we opened a Vinci Technologies Accelerator Development Hub, uh, eight minutes from downtown Pittsburgh. This was a converted steel mill that we've turned into a technology park. Um, as a Pittsburgh guy, I'm pretty excited that we're able to, to convert an old steel mill into a technology hub. Here we'll have about, a, a, when we're all, all up and running, about 150 folks there. It'll be engineers. Uh, manufacturing of our heat pipes and testing, a lot of the testing facilities of our heat pipes. So uh, really excited about opening that facility. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of uh, building, you know, the, ra the way to increase your techn technology readiness is by manufacturing. We've been doing manufacturing of the safety related components. Recently we completed uh, full scale testing of the control drums and the shutdown rods up in our Peterborough and Burlington uh, offices up in Canada. Um, and finally, we did announce uh, late last year our first Avinci customer, the Saskatchewan Research Council, uh, which uh, we have uh, signed a feed contract and we're working with them to pursue the first Avinci reactor uh, in, up in Canada. That concludes my, my uh, talking points for today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. We'll go with Steve, share a little bit about BWXT's vision for uh, microreactors. Steve? Yeah, thank you. If you go to the next slide. So while they're doing that, thanks for everybody for being here. Last session of the RIC. It's uh, always interesting to see who hangs around, which uh, hopefully at this session kept you around. So we're really looking forward to that. Really pleased to be up here with these folks. Um, kind of, I feel kind of humbled by it because They've got a lot more experience than I do in some areas, so I, I appreciate that. Um, so BWXT's vision is to, to large-scale manufacture um, microreactors. If you, if you think about economy of scale, if you think about large light water reactors, they do it by size. Um, you can't do that with microreactors, obviously. You have to do it by volume. And, and, and our vision is to create volume by aggregating demand from the a variety of, of end users out there that, that really need power today. This is a pivotal moment for us in the U.S. for decarbonization, for energy security for these end users. Um, most of the people we're talking to are behind the meter. When I say behind the meter, that, that means um, they, they don't operate off of the electricity grid, nor do they really intend to put power onto the grid. If they've got a little extra, they might, but um, but they're really self-sustaining themselves with power. So, so that's our vision, and, and you'll see, I'll say a few words about BWXT, how that really fits our company. Next slide, please. So just a, a little bit about BWXT. Um, I won't read all of this to you, but I'll point out a couple of things. So we've got 14 major manufacturing facilities in the U.S. and in Canada. Um, we're providing um, hardware to the government, we're providing hardware to the utilities today, both in Canada and in the U.S., um, providing uh, fuel elements to uh, research and test reactors, and, and probably most notably for this session, um, we've, we've made over 400 reactors for the nuclear Navy, and we've delivered those. Um, that's, uh, that's a big number. I didn't realize the number that was that big, um, our, our CEO said that number at our recent earnings call, and I said, wow, great, I, I, wanna, I need to say that. <laughs> so, so. Uh, so next slide, please. So, so 
BWXT is really the, the remaining company from the Babcock and Wilcox company, and, and, and we pride ourselves on innovation. We've been, we've been innovating for 150 plus years, uh, starting off with patenting steam boilers. Um, I won't go through all of these histories, um, but the, the nuclear part of it started in the, the 40s and 50s with the nuclear Navy. And then most recently, um, working on NASA programs for propulsion. Um, we started that actually in 2017, well before our, our current Draco contract, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, we actually migrated into medical isotopes, which is, uh, is really cool. I won't talk about that today, but it's really cool. Um, yeah. Related to microactors, um, we're, we're actively producing trisofuel for the, the Pele demonstration. Um, we, we were awarded the Pele demonstration, which we're going to be standing up in Idaho. I'm really pleased to be working with the Idaho folks there. Um, and then some commercial contracts. And then most recently, the, um, the space nuclear propulsion demonstration, the uh, Draco program, is really, really exciting. All of those, pro all of those advanced programs are, are operating out of our advanced technologies group, which um, is a really exciting group to be with. Next slide, please. So, so in our advanced technology groups, we're, we're focused on space, terrestrial, and, and now commercial. Um, in the space realm, um, much like Westinghouse, we, we've done work on Jetson, we've done work on fission surface power, um, but our, our flagship contract right now is um, with uh, working through Lockheed with uh, NASA and uh, Department of Defense on the Draco Space Propulsion Demonstration Program. Um, it, I won't bore you with telling you all about nuclear thermal propulsion, but I would challenge you to go read about it. It's pretty fascinating, and it, it's quite a material science program, going from cryo-hydrogen to very high temperature hydrogen in a trash can size reactor is pretty cool. <laughs> so, um, on the terrestrial side, of course, we're, we're working on Project Pele. That, that is one of our primary focuses right now. Uh, standing that up at the DOE site. Um, Pele is in the space programs um, we, we view as pathfinders. Those are pathfinders to our commercial programs. Uh, when I say pathfinders, what I, I mean, material testing, material science, regulatory authorization at the DOE site, um, all of these things are pathfinders that, that allow us to then pivot to commercial, one, to, to understand what we know, but more importantly, understand what we don't yet know that we have to go figure out. So you heard Mike talk about testing and those sorts of things. That's, that's the sort of thing that, that, that we thrive on doing in our BWXD facilities. Our commercial pivot is a, a variant called Banner. Uh, we're, we're not real eloquent, so BWXD, Advanced Nuclear Reactor, <laughs> is a uh, is our acronym for that. Uh, Banner is about a 50 megawatt thermal high temperature gas reactor using um, triso fuel. Um, not a particularly novel um, technology, and, and that we did that by choice. Um, we, we don't, we want to use high technology readiness. Um, so the DOE program on triso has been extremely important to us. Um, but the other technologies that are coming out of these high temperature gas reactors, um, recent startup in, in, um, in China, for example, if we can get some data from there, that would be great. So, so that's the banner reactor. Um, very similar to what Mike said for Vinci, the cycle is the same. We want to deliver it out of the factory, fuel it in the factory, deliver it, put it on the site, let people operate it and then bring it back from the site. The, the end users that we're talking to do not want a big infrastructure on their site. They want power. So next slide. So al along those lines, um, we, we entered the, we're very fortunate to work with DOE on the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Project. Uh, we started that a couple of years ago when that came out. And, and that was really a technology development program on a, on a lot of fronts. And we were actually, and continue to work on advanced form of triso fuel. Um, what is emerging, though, is um, Gen Zero of Banner might be standard triso. There, the market demand is is pushing us um, 
it's there now. I, I talk about a market demand emerging, but that might not be the right word. It, it feels like it's there now. So we might be working on a Gen Zero form of TRISO on the first, or Gen Zero banner for the first reactor there. Um, we also entered into an agreement with Wyoming Energy. And the, the Wyoming Energy Agreement is really important to us. Um, Wyoming has been great to work with. What they've done is they've connected us with end users. We, we've got people in Wyoming, as we speak, looking at, at what those needs are, boots on the ground. Um, we're also connecting with other end users um, and, and working to, to aggregate this demand so that we make sure that when we finalize the banner design, it meets as many end user requirements as, as possible. Uh, next slide. So kind of pivoting to, um, to licensing, we've talked, talked a lot about this. Um, the, the, the paper that NRC just sent up to the commission on um, factory manufacturing, uh, we see that as workable. Um, there's a lot of detail in there to be worked through, but um, we, we really do see that as workable. I, I commend NRC for doing that. That, that, um, that was a really lean-in effort by the NRC, which, which industry really appreciates. There you go. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of elements going on for um, regulatory advancements. Uh, where we see the challenge is not so much on the front end. We, it, when we look at this, we, we see a uh, single regulatory review to many, many reactors. On, on the front end, with a manufacturing license or a design certification or something like that, that's achievable. Um, it gets a little more challenging on the back end with, with um, site, um, siting issues, with uh, natural, natural phenomenon issues like seismic, et cetera. So we really see the challenge on the back end. How do you get to a point where I can, I can maybe regionally or with, with a lot of constraints, I can approve deployment of 100 reactors somewhere. I mean, that, that's the scale that we're talking about. And, and we need to be able to get this single review to many deployments on the back end. And I, and I can say um, we've, we've been in discussions with NRC, um, very, very receptive to those kinds of discussions. Um, we're, we're really pleased with the way those conversations are going. So we're, we're, we're very optimistic that we're going to get there. Next slide. So kind of getting off the stage, um, we've, we've seen this, this phrase rising to the moment at a number of the sessions. Um, this is a big moment for us in nuclear, and, and, and we've got an opportunity to rise to it. Um, we think BWXT has some capabilities that, that can come to, to the game and help that and make that happen. Um, and we're working really actively on those deployment models because deploying a reactor and a technology um, sounds great, but I'm going to use a word that's my word, it's not BWXT's word. Uh, we're, we're really building an economy. We're building a microreactor economy that has to start with things like HALU fuel, has to go through the entirety of the reactor deployment, the end user, uh, what they really need, how we get the reactor back into a refurbishment or a storage state, and then ultimately dispose of it. And, and that's, a, that's a whole sort of different economy than the light water reactors working with um, utilities. Uh, that's our challenge. Um, it's what gets up at us up every day at BWXT. We love being in that challenge, so thank you. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. Christy? Thank you. Um, well, I have to say I'm also, you know, really honored uh, to be on this panel with such an inspiring and distinguished group. Um, and I see really our job as, you know, helping to make all of you successful. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what success kind of looks like. And it's really defined by speed and scale. Um, speed in terms of, you know, the need for generating assets to be on the ground by the 2030 timeframe. And scale I'll talk about, you know, but I'm sure you're all aware of the kind of huge demand of clean, reliable energy to support the decarbonization and continued operation and growth without emissions of our most important industrial energy users that make our economies thrive. 
and prosper. So let's talk about what the scale of that demand might look like. So we're, we're talking about tens of gigawatts of demand for global data centers, tens of gigawatts of demand for scope one and two upstream operations by 2030, tens of gigawatts of demand per year to decarbonize offshore oil and gas operations and other marine applications, tens of gigawatts of demand for um, coal fleets in the United States, in Asia, in Ukraine, in Central and Eastern Europe, all within the 2030 timeframe. And what we hear is that major industrial energy users want to cost-effectively decarbonize those existing generating assets that enables the continued operation of those assets, leveraging their existing supply chains and capabilities and continuing to power the global economy without emissions, sustaining those jobs, sustaining the economic and social benefits that these companies are already providing, and accelerating the commercialization and widespread deployment of these new, exciting new zero carbon technologies that we've just been hearing about. So there's a tremendous opportunity right now, but in order to seize that and realize that in that 2030 timeframe, there's some really important actions that have to start today. So we've been working with a, lot, a range of these industrial energy users, and they're evaluating whether nuclear energy could help them meet these decarbonization targets. For example, many companies in the oil and gas sector have 50% emissions reduction targets for scope one and two operations by 2030. And they've made commitments to decarbonize hundreds of gigawatts of on-site and distributed energy, and they're concluding that having some of these manufactured reactors available would be really useful and actually could be their real preferred option. Now, it's worth noting that when I talk about sort of micro-reactors, manufactured micro-reactors in this context, and then I'm talking about tens of gigawatts of demand, you know, you might be wondering, well, how do we bridge that? How do we square that? Well, these manufactured reactors might start out as micro, but remember that most of the world's big, complex industrial machines that we have in the world today get made in factories and in world-class shipyards. And there's absolutely no reason that we can see why manufactured reactors couldn't actually get quite big and ultimately serve quite a large portion of the demand that I'm, that I'm talking about today. But starting small is a great idea to start that learning and understand how we can deliver nuclear technology in a new way made in factories. So let me give you an example. So one group of companies that are interested in using uh, micro-reactors, the, the, the small ones, found 50 gigawatts of existing generators and turbines in their up upstream operations, pumping, compression, operating today. So these are generating assets today in North America. And that's a market for about 5,000 or, 10, or between 5,000 and 10,000 of these micro-reactors in the 2030 timeframe. So the micro-reactors could achieve scale as well. But to achieve the speed and the scale that's required for these decarbonization targets, these companies need products, not construction projects. And confidence on cost and schedule is absolutely fundamental, non-negotiable, strong clear requirement. They need reactors that are mass manufactured, licensed in the factory, that can be rapidly deployed to existing facilities as completed products. They need a commercially viable licensing path that fits within the fast and predictable asset deployment process that they use already today. So that re would require a licensing timeline that can enable a project decision, so identifying a need for a generating asset, to that asset generating in the field within six months. So that would mean shifting the bulk of the NRC reactor licensing process into the manufacturing license, also ensuring that site-specific deployments would be within the boundaries of the manufacturing license and can be therefore accomplished quickly and efficiently. It would mean developing a supplement to the Advanced Nuclear Reactor Generic Environmental Impact Statement specific for micro-reactor deployments to generically disposition additional categories with little or no impact on the environment. It would mean evaluating the use of remote and autonomous operations. It would mean identifying licensing activities that can support a nuclear island that ensures the reactor safety while enabling configurable downstream applications. And it would mean coordinating with the Canadian regulator to ensure that deployments can happen there as well under those same conditions. 
And ultimately, it means that the cost of licensing has to be less than 1% of the total project cost. So those are our commercially viable licensing pathway requirements. And to achieve the goal of those generating assets by 2030, we need to be you know, licensing the technologies before that. We need to be standing up the manufacturing supply chains before that. And we need to be de-risking the commercially viable licensing path before that. So that will require working really closely, coordinating with the NRC, the industry working with all, the NRC working with all of the relevant stakeholders in order to really get alignment around how these requirements are going to be met from all, from all parties in order to ensure that we have a really efficient process and in order to ensure that technology vendors can design for those requirements, the supply chain manufacturing companies can be building the factories that can meet those requirements. And ultimately, everybody needs to be able to see the risk going down. Um, what we are, I'm, I guess I'm here to tell you that those industrials are ready to move um, and we need a really high level of coordination to enable that to happen, to enable the licensing path to meet the speed of the industry. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, everybody. Wow, what a, what a fascinating set of uh, slides and insights. Thank you for, uh, for uh, doing that. Thanks for the acknowledgement of the work by the staff and, and, and the path ahead of us. Um, uh, let me start with a few questions, uh, get us started. We have about 25 minutes or so, so plenty of time for, for a lot of good questions. Um, uh, let's start with just a, a, a simple warm-up of uh, why microreactors? In, in other words, uh, what do you see as the most important benefits for microreactors relative to other reactors? So anyone can, can chime in on that question if you'd like to. Do you want me to start, John? Or? Sure. Um, when, when I think about microreactors broadly, one, of them, one term comes to mind, and that is agility, which may be an, an odd term to, to apply to a nuclear reactor, but relative to, to gigawatt scale plants, for instance, I, I would say that microreactors can be described as agile. So they, you know, uh, similar to my earlier comments about, you know, having an option for every decision you make is, is, is very much uh, a, a reality about with respect to this technology. And, and so if I can humbly apply the word agility to, to microreactors, that's, that's a, a term I would use. Yeah, John, just to add on, I, I would agree, uh, you know, um, flexible, we talk about easily deployable. Um, just Christy, uh, I mean, those projections are what keep me up at night, uh, by the way. Uh, so when we talk about easily deployable. Um, but also, um, what I see and what drives us in our thinking, too, is reliability. Um, when you're, you know, these customers, um, they, de they want something behind the grid. They need it. Um, you know, some of these remote communities, if it, it doesn't operate, people don't live. People, you know, and, and so reliability really needs to drive these machines. And that's really, uh, from, a, from, a, from a design point of view, that's what's driving, driving us. So why microreactors we see, you know, it's the only option we see as far as becoming something that's easily deployable, flexible, and, and can achieve those kind of reliability. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned reliability. So, you know, you can get reliability by building the most robust machine ever. Or you can get reliability by having several and some backups. So micro, micro reactors do offer the opportunity to um, to create that reliability in, in different ways. So. Okay, I'll just throw in a one another one word answer, which would be versatility. You know, I think one of the ways in which we'll achieve our global decarbonization goals within this short 25 years remaining to 25 to 2050 is by repurposing as much of our existing fossil infrastructure as possible. And that means substituting energy services that are being supplied today by fossil fuels with this kind of factory-made technology that can be deployed to a whole range of different kinds of sites and facilities to enable um, heat and power and hydrogen to be provided, su supplied, enabling continued operation of those assets, um, but without emissions. Well, let me stay with you. That, that, was, a, that was a great response. Um, where, where the you know where the microreactors fit. So, uh, how do we catalyze that that vision for a replacement uh, by n n micro reactors of these fossil facilities in in uh, uh, in industrial facilities? We're, we're you know, 
how do we get there? Yeah, I mean, I, I, we, we, we heard in some of the presentations the discussions that are happening around, you know, the opportunities to co-locate these new technologies that have a radically different profile in terms of their potential safety and environmental impacts compared to, you know, more conventional technologies. It should be very feasible to deploy these, you know, nuclear batteries, uh, these micro-reactors to be co-located with existing facilities and benefiting from much of the infrastructure and the skills, the skilled workforces that already are there um, and enable that rapid decarbonization and also enable the market scale to quickly enable the, drive the investment in, uh, in the manufacturing and factories, essentially, that are going to be needed. Super. Thank you. Anyone else to comment on that? Okay. All right. Um, Your presentations and talks so far are, are, are sort of painting a picture that a ton has been done already. A lot of thinking, a lot of aspirational uh, thoughts and ideas. And um, to, to sustain, I mean, in my view, a, a lot still needs to be done. So to, to sustain that progress, wh where do you think the regulator and the industry need to focus? So I, I think. I think what would be beneficial, and, and, and I think we've started down that path, is a more common understanding between the regulator and the industry of just how these business models are going to work, mm -hmm. um, which entities are going to do which functions. Um, I, I think the more we can inform the regulator, the more we can inform you, um, the more you can think forward and be flexible on, on what, you, what you can be part of the solution on. Because I, I, I know, I'll, I'll admittedly from BWXT, we, we probably haven't given you as much information on our business models mm -hmm. as, as you would like or could use. And, um, you know, we met last week, that's going to change. So, looking forward to that. Thank you, Steve. Yep. Duke? Yeah, I'd like to <clears throat> kind of continue on that theme. So. Oh, one, I've been working with advanced reactor licensing and policy for about three years, and one thing that I've seen uh, as a very important driver for the progress that's been made is the communication that's happened between all of the stakeholders uh, and the NRC staff. And I'm not just talking about all of the developers, but you know, other members of the public as well. And we see, we get a lot of information through pre-application engagements. Uh, formally through regulatory engagement plans from developers, but also widespread participation in our periodic advanced reactor stakeholder meetings. And so in these fora, we're able to get information that's not always perfect, not always complete, not final, but it's something to start uh, moving forward with and, and thinking critically about what's going to be needed uh, to be successful in licensing and protecting public health and safety. So I think as, as we continue to go um, through addressing policy topics, it's going to be critical to keep that, that open, transparent communication for, for NRC to keep its independence um, and, and to continue to work on these important topics. Thank you. Uh, Duke, let me stay with you um, a bit. So you, you shared, you shared um, a bit of insights about the, the SECI paper that we sent to the Commission with the number of policy issues that we're presenting. Um, and Steve was kind enough to acknowledge uh, his support, or at least a pleasure with, with that paper. Uh, what else is the staff working on now that we're you know, hearing where, where the industry is trying to go? Um, any ideas that you can share? Well, sh yeah, sure. The, so I showed the, this long list of topics that we've collected, and that, that I think there were 15 or 17 topics on there. Uh, and th those, have, those are collected from a commission paper that was written in uh, 2020, the most recent commission paper, uh, again, through periodic advanced reactor stakeholder meetings and, and other public meetings and interactions. And, and more recently, in December, we, we had a discussion at one of our periodic stakeholder meetings uh, about priorities for the next topic. So at that point, we had already put out our, our draft white paper that became the most recent commission paper. Um, and so we, had, we were ready to start thinking about what's next. Um, and so w the feedback that we heard during that meeting was that a lot of the topics that the NRC staff considers to be priorities line up with what stakeholders consider to be priorities. 
And there are a number of them when you look at them together, such as um, um, citing issues, um, accelerating licensing processes, um, looking at uh, different licensing frameworks that when you, when you get these together, they really start to go towards what Chair Hansen has mentioned recently in his remarks, which is serial licensing or licensing many, many reactors of exactly the same design. And I think we've heard about that uh, from a couple of the panelists today. So, so I, think, I think this is an area where we can make a lot of impact and we have a lot of information already. Our priorities are, are lining up with other priorities. And so I think um, similar to what we did with this last paper, we'll start engaging um, uh, more intentionally on what do we cover uh, next in, in terms of uh, microreactor licensing and deployment policy or, or guidance development. So I, th I think there's just a lot of opportunities for really deeply streamline how we conduct licensing reviews, how we issue licenses, and so it's an area where, where it really deserves a, a fresh look at, at how we do business and, and how we can optimize our processes for more of a widespread deployment model. Thank you, Duke, appreciate it. I would add to Duke as well that, uh, so Duke's described what we're doing on the licensing side. We're also recognizing that uh, uh, these facilities are gonna be built and, and they would need inspections and oversight during construction. And that's an area that we're also applying a fair amount of focus to develop a program that's uh, appropriately scaled, appropriately risk-informed and performance-based to recognize um, uh, uh, the, the, the risk of the facility, apply that in, in the footprint that we're, uh, we, we would be uh, looking to apply, and also recognize the first of a kind versus second versus nth of a kind and be able to grade and, and, and uh, uh, support in that regard. So, uh, so a lot is going on in, the, in, in that area as well. So thanks, Duke. Um, Mike and Steve, that, that's a question to you guys. Um, a large number of topical reports and white papers have been submitted and reviewed by NRC. How important have these became or become, and why are they increasing in use by advanced reactor developers? You mean, so yeah, Mike. I, I can start with then, Steve, yeah. Um, to us, it's incredibly important. Uh, uh, you, we, 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 you're with a new, a new design, you can't wait till you have it all designed before we bring it to the regulator and only find out what were you even thinking? Uh, so uh, we've used this, uh, we have put uh, over the past uh, several years over 30 white papers with you all, got invaluable feedback. Uh, we used those same white papers and, and I'll say we put our, uh, a Canadian view on it and have used those with the Canadian, the same white papers with the Canadian regular. So it's, 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 it's really important for us to get that feedback early so that we can factor that in. Also, I think it's important for us to tell you what we're looking at from our business model. You know, I remember when we first talked about factory fueling, what does that mean? Um, what does it mean, mean to, to do 10 reactors a year or 50 reactors a year and start thinking about what that means and the implications? Um, you know, we obviously have to get to you know, a standard design, a standard licensing process, get as much of that uh, operations piece of it into that standard approach. So. We can you know, design license once, build many, and I think we do need to get the, that back-end licensing to a, a six-month kind of a window. And, and the only way you can start having those ideas is, is, is getting these, these, early, uh, these early engagement, these white papers. Um, so to us, it, it's, it's been invaluable um, uh, as, a, as a step forward. Thanks, Mike. Steve, anything to add? Yeah, no, I, I appreciate what Mike said. It, it's, it's exactly true. If, if you can bring closure to technical questions, technical issues, policy issues, if, if you can bring closure to those things early, then you're, you're game up. And mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I, I have actually seen, thinking back to our Empower days, uh, I've actually seen uh, more motivation from NRC on the white papers to give more definitive responses to those things in recent years, and, and that, that's really, really important. Um, even if the answer is no, saying no early mm -hmm. is helpful, because then we know where to move. <laughs> so, yeah. so definitely appreciate that. Thank you, and, and thank you for, 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 for your thoughts on that. And, and from the regulator's perspective, it was 
Um, we did recognize uh, from, from the beginning that, that there are questions associated with the technology. There are questions associated with the compatibility of the technology with the regulatory framework. So um, there were always uh, feedback that were given about the, the, the U.S. approach and, and the ability to do stage licensing. And, and this is as close as we were able to get to be able to provide uh, uh, sort of a, 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 a stage licensing to the extent that we could. Uh, as, as much of definitive information as possible. Um, the discussion about cost also that was, it was important to us to address. So we, we devised a number of sets. You can have verbal feedback, you can have feedback you know, through slides and, and alike. So, so we're able to scale uh, to, to, to what supports the needs. And, um, and the question uh, has a, a, a great point in it that we're seeing an expansion of the user. You know, in, in other words, it's useful, it's adding value for, you know, uh, industries, it's, it's feeling that it, it's actually supporting them. Um, one of the stats I didn't mention, so uh, the slide had on it 90 over the past five or six years or so. Uh, we're thinking at least 70 just over the next year and a half uh, in, in our calc. So, so the, the expansion is, is meaningful. Um, so thanks for, for that. Um, Duke, this is, uh, this is a question for you. Uh, for, for factory fabric, for, I'm sorry, for factory manufacturers reactors, any consideration for a combined manufacturing SNM, uh, special nuclear material, and transportation licenses instead of separate license applications? Well, there are provisions in the regulations for combining applications and um, combining proceedings for various applications. So I think there are ways that uh, efficiencies can already be achieved without actually making all of that one single license. Um, I know that, as we've heard from other panelists, you know, there's an idea that maybe we can drive into the manufacturing license some things that might typically be held for a combined license or a construction permit or operating license. So these are ideas that we want to continue to engage on and that I think we'll be uh, having more dialogue on in the future. But I think right now we do have ways to gain efficiencies through the current regulatory processes to make those various aspects of the deployment model um, able to be looked at at the same time uh, up front. Thanks, Duke. Uh, Chrissy, this one, Kirsty, this one is for you. Um, <laughs> can you share more about the potential to deploy microreactors for uh, natural disaster response efforts? What are the benefits of doing so? Well, um, you know, as we've been hearing, it's possible to, you know, have uh, standardized products licensed in a factory that can be moved to a location within a relatively short time frame. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that sounds like a pretty good set of, you know, conditions for uh, emergency response. One thing that we haven't talked about today, but, you know, just to sort of add this in, is um, the interest in shipyard manufactured uh, reactors. Um, of course, ship, world-class shipyards are the highest productivity manufacturing environments in the world. So, you know, they're a different kind of factory, if you like. Um, and those shipyards could be manufacturing uh, reactors for terrestrial deployments, but they could also be making reactors that are located on barges that could be deployed uh, in emergency response as well. Um, and, you know, that, that could be a very fast and effective way um, to, to respond to, you know, emergencies in coastal regions, but actually also, you know, uh, deployments in, through big rivers as well. Mm -hmm. okay. Super, thank you. Um, uh, this is a question for the NRC staff, so that's not me, that's Duke. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you mentioned manufacturing licenses, but, but in the past the agency has said there, there, there does not appear to be any interest in such licenses. Has that changed? And have any vendors indicated plans to use uh, manufacturing licenses? And, and um, uh, also, could, you, uh, could the reactor vendors answer the question as well? Uh, do they plan on using them? So, so just getting back to the question itself, um, uh, it is true that, uh, I'll start, <laughs> you, can, you, can, you can fill in. Uh, it is true that manufacturing licenses have not been used before. But, uh, but I, I mean, I would honestly say that it needed microreactors to be used, you know, so it's sort of, they, they go hand in hand. It was a, in my view, it was a visionary um, uh, uh, instrument, if you would, put in the regulations and in anticipation of, 
of such uh, products coming into the future. So, so I think uh, the fact that they have not been used, it, it does not imply that they're not useful or, or, or a valuable instrument. It was just their time wasn't, wasn't there yet, but, but you know, I would say now the time is, is, is approaching and it's, uh, you know, it's here in my view. But uh, let me go to uh, Steve and, and Mike. Any interest in the industry in, in terms of using a manufacturing license? Yeah, absolutely. So when, when I spoke to the commission on part 53, I, I, you know, I said BWXT is very interested in a manufacturing license. I, I think today we're at the point where that, that is the most useful path forward for what we're going to try to do. So mm -hmm. uh, that, that we were very interested then. We, we think it's the path forward today. Yeah. Good to hear. Thank you. Yeah, we can, we concur, um, and, and I think that you know there's details to work out, but uh, we 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 intend to pursue that um, in, in exactly what that looks like uh, in practice. Uh, um, we want to get the, the 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 process license, the manufacturing process, the manufacturing license. We want to leave in the, the factory ready to go. Uh, we, we we don't want another hundred or 500 ITAC sitting at the site waiting for us to, for our micro reactor mill. Um, but the, the, um, the other piece of that is really, and, and, and so the interesting thing we're kind of dealing with too is, okay, f uh, for a reactor that's gonna go in Canada, um, what does that look like if we're gonna be building this in the US and exactly how do they um, provide their oversight there? So we see maybe a manufacturing license, uh, but maybe fueling the reactor under the, the licensee's license. So we have to figure this out. But, the, but uh, it does make it interesting when you talk about building a, a, a reactor in one country and you're gonna send it to another, uh, so. Thanks, Mike. And, and it, to build on that, what Duke said is really important, the ability to combine licenses. You don't know exactly how the business model is gonna work out, but if you, if you vertically integrate from the point of <clears throat> making fuel to delivering a reactor, um, th there are many different kinds of safety analyses, tools that go into that um, from a Part 70 license or, or um, so, so it, it's vitally important to figure out that business model and figure out just how many licenses you're going to combine or how <laughs> many are going to be separate. And, and, and we're actually going through that. So. Super. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Um, John. We, we heard uh, throughout the panel, actually, the discussion about uh, autonomous ops or automated operations, remote operations. Um, I'll just be blunt. How far are we from, from getting there? And how do we get there? So, so, so I, th this is a very interesting topic because it's a, a, a key to economics, I think, as most uh, economical operation of microreactors, as most would agree. Um, the, uh, on the flip side, you know, we, we can get a, get, easily find ourselves in front of our headlights if we, if we go too far too fast. But, um, you know, the, the good news is we have very robust advanced sensors um, that, that we're looking at on, in various research and development programs. <coughs> um, uh, again, to, to, to enable robust structural health monitoring and, and, and monitoring of the reactor in and of itself. So. Uh, it's it's an incredible opportunity, in my opinion, with microreactor technology, owing to their simplicity, uh, to deploy this sort of technology and 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 get used to it. Um, I would stop short of saying we're gonna we're gonna come out of the gate with fully autonomous operation, but but you know clearly clearly there's there's room for 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 uh, deployment of, of automated schemes and, and, and automated uh, working in conjunction with, with, uh, with limited staffing. Um, but even, you know, beginning to, to consider autonomous operation, we, we, we want reliable decision making. We want to remove the, the human in the loop to, to, to the extent possible. Um, again, I'll, I'll stress that, that if there's ever a, a nuclear technology that, that, that's, that's uh, synergistic with, with progress in this space, it's microreactors. Thank you, John. John, I, I echo that. I mean, that it's, we all want to get there, but we've got to get there in a responsible way. We need to demonstrate it first, that, that how reliable they are. Uh, we were in front of the ACRS uh, describing Da Vinci and our engineers, uh, you know, didn't we're, we're, we're describing the how it operated, and the ACRS kept asking, "Yes, 
but do you require an operator? And I think our engineers were afraid to say yes. And, and then we finally said, yes, we have a reactor trip switch. Don't worry. And they said, good, exactly what we're looking for. So yes, uh, uh, we need, we need a, but we, it is a vision. It's where we want to get to. But it, I think we've got to go there yep. a step at a time. I, I agree. I agree. So we're, uh, we're, we're coming down to the end of, uh, of, of our session here. But, but there's one question I really wanted to ask before we leave. But are we doing enough? to strengthen public confidence in the safety and the viability of this new technology? Anyone? Shall I go? Yes, please. Everyone's looking at me, so yes. that's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll be much better. <laughs> so the first thing to say is that the um, independent, highly effective, rigorous, authoritative, qualified, professional regulator that we have is fundamental to public confidence. So thank you, NRC, thank you. for being the sort of first port of call in building and, and maintaining public confidence. And actually, as we all know, nuclear energy has an unmatched safety track record in terms of any other generating technology, right? So that's, be that's partly because of the commitment on professionalism and quality of the way that the nuclear industry operates and through the interaction with the regulator. So that's the fundamental way that we will maintain and sustain public confidence. But ultimately, in order to really sort of achieve the same levels of confidence that the other you know, energy infrastructures and energy um, generators enjoy, we have to normalize this technology, which means we have to start deploying it at scale, mm -hmm. making it much less unusual, much less you know, sort of boutique and peculiar and just fully normalizing it and maintaining those standards and you know continuing to deliver you know those those excellent outcomes for humans and for the environment and for the economy and for society at large so kind thank you thanks for your words uh, uh, That's it. what a fabulous panel uh, heart, uh, heartwarming To our audience, thank you. Thank you for your thoughtful questions and for your engagement with us. And, and uh, get home safe. See you next year. <laughs>